Good afternoon. I'm Christy LaFall. I am a regional planner here at ABAG MTC. Thank you for attending our planning innovations event. Um, I want to actually test the lights a little bit so um, I know our IT folks can see me, but I couldn't get into the room to um, get some help with that. Maybe we can, okay. So let's just test that out. But um, so, for, so for presentations, we'd like to have a little bit dimmer lighting. But I can give some background about the series and about um, the actual event today. Thanks. Is this, this is good. Oh, they're doing, maybe they're doing it remotely. Thank you. <laughs> Kind of funny. All right. So this is a good lighting for everybody. Um, thank you. Um, we will be recording this event, so we want to have adequate lighting for folks who are going to be watching it online later on. Um, also, um, just for the general audience to know, the Planning Innovation Series has been a, a series we've tried to um, inform local jurisdictions and staff about how to better prepare for infill development uh, in prior development areas throughout the region. So the speakers really complement, the speaker series really complements the PDA implementation program of Plan Bay Area. Um, regionally, we've tried to, we've been supporting on um, prior development areas throughout the region through PDA planning grants, technical assistance grants, and also staffing grants. And so some of those grants are able, um, are able to um, inform sp specific plans, adoption of those plans, EIRs, but also there's county um, congestion management money available also through the OBAG program for things like complete streets and some of the different um, projects that we've worked on with tr through transportation. Um, the whole series for planning innovations, we're actually going through a more of a um, and what, you know, how do we, how do we want to inform folks in that throughout the region? What are the different ways we want to have different formats for this series? So not just you know, formal panels sitting here talking to folks in the, in the Bay Area Metro Center, but to get out in the streets and look at some of the projects and more of the examples of what we're trying to achieve in the, the PDA framework. Um, what you'll know is that we've, um, if you're not aware, we did a, a webinar series this summer uh, that was about the Housing Accountability Act and also SB 35. So this is more just a different way to try and reach folks who aren't able to actually come in and attend meetings here at the center. But again, um, we're just you know, playing around, trying to figure out what's the best way to reach folks and try and make this as, as accessible as possible. Um, one of the other bigger ideas is um, we're trying to maybe merge disciplines. So we're trying to just you know, get out of just the land use transportation box and bring in some more content around sustainability, around you know, green streets. And so this event really does kind of capture some of the public works planning and sustainability kind of mergers um, for the work that we're trying to, to showcase. Uh, there'll be a survey actually with planning innovation. So we're, we're planning to distribute, do disseminate a survey in the next several months, hopefully by the end of the year. And that really, that survey is to try and get more ideas about the content that we offer throughout the series and just to see like where folks are, uh, what they're interested in learning and what degree of information folks are interested in hearing more information about, whether it's introductory kind of policy information or whether it's more in-depth step-by-step guidance toward um, implementation. So with that, um, the Green Streets event, um, the Green Streets to Complete Streets event, I've had some personal uh, work with this over the, my tenure with ABAG, also with East Bay Corridor's work, but um, we have a great panel today. And <clears throat> what we're trying to do really is think beyond complete streets. Think beyond um, just um, accessing all modes and some of the MTC policies around that. We're trying to figure out how to bring in that kind of triple bottom line of sustainability, of uh, safety, equity, but also looking at how the, what is the infrastructure that we're trying to really achieve in these PDAs. So um, we have a great panel of folks. There's a, in your packet, there should be, well, it's not really a packet, but if you were able to pick up an agenda and also a form with the bios, I, I won't go through the bios of each, of each speaker, but I will kind of go through the agenda so that you can see how the day will flow. All right. And there's some more copies coming, just in case you weren't able to grab one. So we'll first have Josh Bratt with the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. He'll be giving an introduction about urban greening and his work here at the, the regional offices. Then uh, we'll have Larry Zimmer, the Director of Transportation and Public Works from the city of Healdsburg. He'll be featuring um, the Healdsburg Avenue Roundabout, or Healdsburg Avenue Plan, but I call it the Roundabout, in quotes. <coughs> Great project. Um, then Leo Chow and Otis Chan from the city of San Mateo will feature some green infrastructure projects in that city and some of their PDA Nexus um, activity and then we'll have a break around three o'clock. We'll do a little 10 minute break, a kind of um, check in bathroom, um, water, whatever you need. Um, I know the San Mateo speakers do have to leave at three. So if you have a quick question for them, you can grab them right at the break. 
After we come back from break, we will have a, a presentation from the San Francisco Estuary Institute staff, uh, Tony Hale and Jing Wu, who will talk about the Green Planet Tool, um, Green Planet Toolkit, which is really a host or a suite of tools that you can use online for um, site locating green infrastructure, optimizing where to locate green infrastructure, and also um, figuring out what is the best um, long-term use for tracking and, and those sorts of things. So think about the regulatory framing, the planning framing, how do we really um, work together with different departments within cities and try to answer some of these questions. Hopefully our panel will um, answer most of those questions for us. And I'll give the mic over now to Josh. All right, uh, good afternoon. Uh, as Christy said, my name is Josh Bratt. I am a planner at the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. And the Estuary Partnership is a collaborative organization that works with all levels of government, works with the, uh-oh, woo, works with all level of government, um, the science community, the academic community, uh, nonprofits and and citizen groups to uh, develop programs, policies, and projects that protect uh, water quality and habitats in and around the bay. And I'm going to describe to you today um, the work that we're doing uh, with our partners to really improve the conditions for widespread use of green infrastructure around the Bay Area. Uh, we received a grant from the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund from the EPA uh, about two years ago to work with the listed partners on the left-hand side uh, in various combinations to develop and improve tools, strategies, and, um, and, and actually build physical projects um, that, will, that will essentially um, advance municipal compliance with the latest version of the uh, Municipal Regional Stormwater Permit and more importantly, to begin ramping up implementation um, around the Bay of, of this new approach to uh, street engineering. Um, the products on the left-hand side um, are an array of these strategies, an array of the tools that, that were developed, and we're going to be talking about all of them throughout the course of today's program. And I'm going to see if I can make this button work. Okay. <laughs> so in the Bay Area, uh, green infrastructure is typically uh, used to describe low impact development in the public realm. Um, that would be in parking lots, on streets, on sidewalks, um, in any public spaces. Um, and it includes uh, interventions like rain gardens, grassy swales, uh, tree wells, um, anything that is going to capture stormwater and stormwater runoff close to its source, impound it, and try to run it through some type of nature-based filtration system uh, to, to pull out pollutants, to strand the trash at the top, and then to allow that cleansed water to um, go through the system and ultimately into the bay. And um, this is an example of interpretive signage that we've created for um, regional branding of green streets and green infrastructure to be used at various projects um, around the Bay. This is a template that can be um, adapted um, and it is available for municipalities who are doing projects and it's a way of really showing, showing the public uh, what, this, what this work is and why, they're, you know, why their streets were dug up for a few months and now, there's, now it looks real pretty but what's it doing? Um, so this is telling, telling the story there, and you can see that um, we can do it in multiple languages as well. So we have the English version up top, and depending on the community, we would have a different type of translation also. Um, another term that's arisen quite recently um, beyond uh, green streets is the term sustainable streets. And that's uh, really a, a term that's, being, that's been coined because... Um, there has been a movement um, from the conventional street uh, design approach. I'm sorry for the small, the, the small image, but this is a conventional um, street layout. You know, we have the center line, we have traffic going one direction, we have parking spaces, we have uh, an extended crosswalk. It's very long, um, but you know that that has uh, been kind of usurped for a new paradigm called complete streets. 
And Complete Streets is um, it's a federal designation. It comes with federal money. Um, it's really important that it comes with federal money because that really um, gets cities to you know, take that carrot and build these projects. And what it does is it elevates uh, more multimodal uh, transportation approaches to the same status as cars, or maybe even demotes cars a little bit uh, to promote walking, to promote uh, transit, and, and just to make the, the, uh, the streets um, just a better place to be. It also includes a lot of the, the ADA improvements. You'll see that the, you know, we have better crosswalk striping. We have a, a curb bump out that makes the crosswalk um, shorter. We have a, an area right here for protection. Um, trees down the middle. We have a bike lane. You know, that's another of, of the multimodal pieces. And, and it's lost a couple parking spaces, as you can see. And this is also comes with the fact that we are, you know, infill developing these days. You know, so we're going from that small shopping center to something maybe with much more stacked uh, units. And, and, you know, we are, we are getting crowded here. And uh, the streets are no, no different. And you know, we, we are positing that complete streets is a great idea, but it's missing something. It's missing the stormwater element because stormwater um, technology and infrastructure has always been a part of our streets and our roadways, um, draining, draining the roadways to make sure that you know, people can get where they need to go. And the streets have always been that, that collector, collector space. And so with green infrastructure, um, on top of complete streets, we have the new term sustainable streets. And uh, we, we, I think, coined that term when we initiated a, uh, a year-long discussion um, with the transportation uh, investment community as well as the natural resources agencies to try to talk about how we can bring funding streams together to make it easier for municipalities to get money to, um, to implement these projects. And the, the product of, of those discussions, which were um, run and hosted by BASMA, which is the Bay Area Stormwater Management Agencies Association, um, was the development of what's called the, the Funding for Sustainable Streets, the Roadmap for <laughs> Road... <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a long title, and you'll see it soon. Um, I want to just briefly walk through a number of projects that we've done in the past or that, that um, sort of representative of green infrastructure um, in and around the, the Bay Area. Um, this one is a early project on San Pablo Avenue in El Cerrito. And it is, um, we have a, a before and an after shot. And so before we had, you know, this planter strip that had very highly compacted turf um, not doing much of a benefit or service to anybody, um, not even, not really even the bugs, likely. Um, and swap that out for um, an array of rain gardens, of cells that actually have, have at the curbside little runnels where stormwater can come in um, and get into all of these cells. They fill up. Um, the cells are, are layered with um, special soils, and within those soils are microbes and tree roots and um, processes from which um, there's this um, biologic uptake of pollutants as well as this filtration of the water as, as the water seeps through. This is underlain with, um, with piping and that cleansed water then is connected to the storm drain system. And uh, there's a, a, another array of rain gardens a couple blocks north of this particular set that was built at the same time. Um, they were monitored by the San Francisco Estuary Institute um, for um, capturing water before it goes into the treatment system and then water at, um, from the, from the subdrain pipes um, after the water has been cleansed and it showed significant reductions in, um, in heavy metals and in PCBs and polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which um, are ubiquitous in, the, in, our, in our roadways. So these things do a lot of work in terms of uh, water quality and they also do a lot of work in terms of placemaking. I mean, this is a this is a nicer sidewalk to walk on than it was before. And it's a benefit to the adjacent um, shops as well. Uh, this is an example of a, com of a complete uh, street reconstruction. Um, this is in, in the city of Campbell on Hacienda Ave, where um, they were planning a road diet and some major reconstruction of, of the street itself. 
and this is the project after the fact. And so what we see here are a series of uh, grassy swales, uh, flush curbs. Folks are parking on this strip. We have a bike lane. Then we have a flush curb condition. So you, know, you don't have that six inch curb right there, so you don't need curb cuts. That water just sheets right into the swales and is treated. Um, SFEI also monitored this site, and they were really um, looking, looking to see what the water quality impacts were, and they found that the pipes below stayed very, very dry, even with um, big storms. Um, the water is just being absorbed into these, and so it's um, taking a lot of hydraulic loading off of the piping systems, um, which is important to the public works folks who are out there rotting catchments and, and uh, making sure that there's not loose, nuisance flooding on the surface. This is an example of tree well filters. Um, there are some that you can, you know, you can actually buy from corporations that are, that are units and proprietary. Um, this is a set of actual um, test, test uh, tree well filters that are non-proprietary. And you know, the, the issue here is that you know, trees, you know, just by the way they're shaped and where they sit, in the street, they do perform a function in terms of stormwater intervention, but it can really be maximized if you are able to convey that stormwater right to where their root systems are um, and, and get that water there. You know, um, so oftentimes when we have plant uh, trees in the in the uh, in tree wells, or when we have tr street trees just in that typical kind of uh, you know four by four cutout in the sidewalk you know, that's only getting some of the water that's sheeting over to it. Um, and it can do much more than that. This is an example of um, a full width um, permeable paving application. This is in the city of Berkeley. Um, it's at a trash hot spot in front of uh, Berkeley High School. And this was a demonstration project to, um, you know, to, to see if it would work to stay traffic rated um, it's something that their public works commissioners really pushed the city to do for many years. Um, and when the city finally uh, passed a bond measure to improve the, the uh, pavement conditions, they al also uh, obligated themselves to do a certain amount of green infrastructure as well. And so this is one of their pilot projects here. And I just put that little insert in just to show that the, the, the spacings in between the pavers are, are, are what does the work. You know, that the water goes down in through those into a, a gravelly sub-basin um, and the water is in there. And again, it's, um, it's filtering out pollutants before it gets to an underdrain catchment um, and it strands trash at the top. And say you're not on the streets, but you have uh, sort of a, a, an open space, um, those also can be modified. Um, so this is the Ohlone Greenway. Uh, which is part, which is right um, along the elevated BART system um, in El Cerrito, and um, there was just a, a big piece of open space, and the city thought that this would be a great opportunity to put in a, uh, a bioretention unit, and they've done that, and it also serves as a parklet. You know, in a sitting situation, um, it's a beautiful place to sit um, when you have some time, and then go to the shopping center that's right close by or the BART. So. All of this is to say that things are changing. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the stormwater permit has set, set out um, a number of, of requirements to make green infrastructure um, much less of an opportunistic um, approach that might be random to something that needs to be planned very deliberately um, on a watershed basis, looking at drainage, looking at um, sub-basins, and, and really meeting those needs and creating targets. Um, targets for um, hydraulic loading, targets for uh, pollutant interception, and creating plans that will meet those targets and how they're gonna meet those targets um, in the future um, with report back, with targets that are set for 2020, 2030, and 2040. And if you look at um, the due dates on the right-hand side, you'll see that a lot of those dates have already passed, and if, uh, Many of you are planners here. I'm hoping that you are aware of the schedule. I'm hoping you're aware of all of this that has gone on because the first part, you know, the very first step in, in the plan and the requirements was about interdepartmental coordination. Um, you know, the, the Water Board understands that, that cities work in silos like so many bureaucracies and understands that there needs to be, 
you know, a full span of, of interactions uh, to make sure that opportunities are identified early on and are taken advantage of for um, capital improvement projects where, th where there can be a green um, infrastructure element um, approach appended to it. And you'll also see in the um, bold areas are the places where the, the project that I was describing on my second slide, the Urban Greening Bay Area project, uh, created tools to meet, to meet these. And again, we're gonna talk about these more in length, but the SFEI uh, developed the LID tracker tool and made uh, improvements to their green plan uh, IT, their green plan it tool. Um, we have three uh, in the ground projects planned. Uh, one is already constructed and Leo will be talking about um, a second one in San Mateo. Uh, BASMA um, stewarded uh, the development of conceptual details for uh, typical intersections and how to put in green infrastructure, um, pretty much uh, curb extension bulb outs at intersections, at typical intersections, and so those are off the shelf uh, plan sets that can be used in house by, um, by city designers and engineers um, to make sure that, that you know, uh, to keep the costs down and, and what, you know, what needs to be included in a plan set. Uh, the funding roadmap is, uh, we will talk about, and that really is, you know, how do we create, uh, or actually how do we streamline um, the funding mechanisms that are, that are already there to make them easier for cities to access and use, and what, the, what do the cities need to do to create revenue streams on their own that can be leveraged for, um, you know, for, for grants to come in from outside sources. Um, this is an, the example of, this is uh, San Jose's project that they built um, using, using uh, grant funding from, from this particular grant as well as from DWR's uh, integrated water management, <laughs> regional water management program. And uh, this has uh, a number of bioretention units and permeable paving along this uh, big uh, city park that they have. Now, I'm also a manager of um, what's called the San Pablo Avenue Green Stormwater Spine. This is a project that was um, really conceived after that, uh, you know, the array of rain gardens that are on, on San Pablo Avenue and El Cerrito that I showed on one of those slides. Um, the idea was to use San Pablo Avenue as the, as the, uh, as sort of a, a common point in a, in, a, in a corridor where we would do demonstration projects in seven cities at seven sites. We ended up having eight sites in the seven cities, uh, where all of all of the cities themselves um, identified where they wanted to to do their locations. So we're starting in Oakland in the very downtown on the second block of San Pablo Avenue, um, right by their city hall. Um, we have one. In, we have one proposed for Emeryville um, by um, West MacArthur Boulevard. We have uh, two close to each other, close to Cordonistas Creek in Berkeley and Albany. Uh, we have El, one in El Cerrito. These are mapping some some of the old El Cerrito projects, and then in Richmond we have one at McBride, and another one way up the street um, in San, in the city of San Pablo. And I've found over time that, um, you know, this is complicated work. It's complex work. Um, it's not quite as easy as just digging a depression um, and, letting, and letting water just accumulate there. Um, these these uh, right-of-ways are very programmed. They're very crowded with existing um, um, utilities that are both above ground and underground. Um, there's a lot of liability concerns. There's a lot of oversight in terms of ADA compliance and the like, and so it gets to be very expensive. Um, and you know, one of the learning lessons I would say is that doing stormwater retrofits on a space like this um, for its own sake doesn't really pencil out economically, but you know, putting green infrastructure and appending it to larger projects, projects that are in the pipeline and making space for those, those improvements um, is very economical and, and derives a whole suite of benefits um, above just the water quality um, benefits that, that, that sometimes seem like the driver. Um, and in fact, you know, these are very place-based and, and place-making um, applications. So 
I'm just going to run you through a couple of the designs. We haven't built any yet. Um, we are working with East Bay Mud for them to do some pipeline relocations at several of the sites. Um, two of the sites we actually just had to um, jettison because uh, the tributary area to the sites that were selected were too small to get the water quality credit. Um, and another one was m moving um, PG&E gas lines was kind of not only very exorbitantly expensive, but also um, it was indeterminate when they would get to the work. So um, this is our Oakland site. Again, it's that first, it's, it's, our, it's uh, our southernmost project. And it is taking, this is the before condition. This is a rendering of what it should look like afterwards. So it's a linear block long rain garden um, with boardwalks that, that cross over the top. And to make that happen, uh, we would be changing from diagonal parking to parallel parking. So the city is losing some parking spaces. Um, we are taking out a street median um, to make way for uh, bike lanes that have been proposed for the area. So again, this is multimodal. Um, new bike lanes are coming in. And with the bike lanes, they are asking us to, to, to restripe this side of the uh, street, which is outside of our, our actual um, improvements. But they would like the diagonal parking to be uh, facing the other way so that since it's on a bike lane, cars won't be backing out of their, their spots creating conflicts with bikers, but instead they would be backing into the spots and then pulling out head first and they would be able to see bikers coming. So it's, I think that's a really interesting approach. It's a, it's a great project. I can't wait to build it. Um, <laughs> this is our Emeryville site. Um, as you can see, there's this huge swath of unused blacktop right here. Um, and there's, there's this building right here that is under development. It used to be... Um, it was the Maz building, and I'm not sure exactly what it was used for. I, I think it might even have been an automotive showcase building. It's got these big rolling doors, um, but it's been bought by a developer, and it's, been, um, it's being redeveloped to have like um, 100, 100 units, uh, residential units with uh, retail space below. And so what we are going to be doing is we're going to be taking all of that blacktop and converting it into a large bioretention basin. Um, we're going to have flush, uh, we're going to have kind of that flush curb condition. We're creating some parking right here. This is an underpass that's right next to it, if you're familiar with the area. Uh, this is at grade that empties out into San Pablo Avenue. So this would be a really large kind of park looking area. Um, what was proposed um, on top of this, in fact, was that the developer adjacent wanted to build a deck on top of it, um, a public use deck in Parklet, which we were all for, and we were working with them on how to design that in a way that would, um, in a way that we would still get the treatment, but also have that public use space. Unfortunately, um, the development, um, as it has been constructed, has been uh, lit on fire twice, five alarm fires and arson, so there, they don't have the money to build the deck anymore, so that might be something in the future. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through, um, this is our Berkeley site. Um, it's a very simple project. These are just curb extension uh, planters um, that we're proposing, and this is what it would look like, and this is right by the McDonald's in Berkeley. I think it's one of the only two McDonald's in Berkeley. Um, in terms of making spaces, um, again, so this is a PDA corridor. This is, this is a, a, a priority development corridor. Um, a lot of the cities have done their own internal studies and they wanted our designs to really lift up their um, living corridor plans. And so this is El Cerritos, this is their midtown approach and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a uh, dedicated bike lane right against the existing face of curb and we're gonna be adding treatment um, cells in the street um, in where the parking lane would be. Um, which is outboard of, of, the, uh, of the bike lanes. And this is our Richmond site at, um, at McBride, where we have been given um, permission by the private property owner to actually encroach into the parking lot and uh, incorporate some of the, some of the greening um, on, on their property as well. And this is, oh. um, so this is that intersection we were just looking at. Uh, we are going to modify it and have a, a curb extension bus stop with the bus stopping in the right-hand lane of travel. Um, we are getting rid of these two. These were going to be two long swales. We can't do them because of, uh, ex of conflicts with PG&E. 
um, but we're hoping that we can get this one built, but we're looking for the money to do some PG&E um, relocation there. But this is ultimately what that would look like, and it's part of um, a plaza kind of condition that the city really was interested in and part of their, their corridor plan as well. And finally, um, the last product um, that I just want to just call your attention to is that roadmap of funding solutions for sustainable streets. I think we will be talking about this in our panel discussion, but really it's, it was uh, those conversations with the transportation in, in, uh, investment uh, community agencies as well as natural resources agencies and where their, um, their current and existing uh, programs overlap or don't overlap and are there bridges that we can build between them to make them more user friendly because we understand that you know, a lot of times city staff, it's really difficult to uh, write four grants for one project and then manage all four of them. And uh, if, we can, if we can streamline that in any way, that's what we're gonna be working to do. So uh, here's my last slide. Thank you for your attention. And I think we're gonna get into um, some of the resources also later, but uh, if you go to sanfranciscoestuary.org slash greenstreets, you will find a resources page that has a lot of the uh, information that's found in this pamphlet that was at the front door. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Load up Larry Zimmer presentation. So, are all of you over there able to see when Josh was doing the red pointer on the screen? Because otherwise, I can try it on the cursor, but okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, Larry Zimmer. I'm from the city of Healdsburg, a longtime public works engineer. I'm here to talk to you about a very specific project in a little more detail. A lot of similarities to what Josh just presented. Um, a couple years ago, I would have just called this a complete street project, but um, it certainly has the green aspects, and uh, now I refer to it as a sustainable project. So just a little bit of where Healdsburg is, um, we're north Sonoma County, uh, along the 101. Um, pick out the pointer here. There are basically three ramps off of the freeway. Um, the city is completely on the east side of the freeway, and there is a small chunk of the city just south of the river. So there are two ramps, really, because one of them um, exits out and goes to this area, you have to cross over a rather undersized bridge. The reason I'm saying that is um, visitors to Healdsburg are kind of forced into one of two ramps. Uh, the northernmost is actually the biggest traffic problem in Healdsburg. For those of you who live in the city, it's not a problem, but for those who live in Healdsburg, it's the biggest problem. Um, so everyone ultimately is going into the Central Healdsburg ramp off the 101, whether you're coming from the north or, um, I mean, if you're coming northbound or if you're coming southbound, either way, you end up at, this is the project site. Um, just looking at the map a little bit, this is the Healdsburg Plaza. For those of you who have not visited, um, that's probably where you would visit if you came. It's uh, sort of the shopping, restaurants, wine tasting hub. Um, if we had a PDA, which we do not currently, this is most likely the location or that area. So as I said, uh, it's a very much a tourist town. This is the, the hub of the tourist town, and wine is central to this. So there is a fair number of wine tasting establishments along with plenty of uh, alcohol flowing at all of the restaurants. Um, quite a bit of shopping, the plaza draws uh, special events, uh, so we do get quite a crowd on the, uh, particularly on weekend days. So as you'd imagine, um, 
there is a assortment of transportation in this small area, which includes the project site, which I'm getting to. Um, we have a train running through the middle of, the middle of town, which is not running yet, but soon to be extended of uh, the smart train, which is working its way up to Windsor, which is just south of Healdsburg. Um, and I guess frame of reference, uh, Healdsburg is about 20 miles north of Santa Rosa. So we also have a trail. In fact, let me go back for a second. So we have, this is the train. We have a creek which has a trail, Foss Creek, and the trail runs along the creek um, quite a ways north and will ultimately go through city limits. And then it runs along the train tracks. Um, this is the plaza that I told you about. And then uh, quite a bit of truck traffic because along with all of the wineries, we have uh, agricultural vehicles and some really large trucks coming through and they all go through that same intersection. So this is what it looked like before the project. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> so well, you, one thing you'll notice is there's no pedestrian crossing on the south side. This is Healdsburg Avenue. You're looking north going this way basically. Um, how do you gate the train? if you start having smart running passenger rail through here. Um, pedestrians coming from one side having to go completely around extremely long distances on the pedestrian crossings. Um, the creek, which you can't even see here, uh, it, here's the last of the exposure of the creek, runs underground up and over, and then that's where it connects with a, a very nice trail which runs through the city. Um, so all kinds of issues here as far as transportation and obviously aesthetics. This is the gateway into a touristy area. This isn't what we want. So everyone recognized that. Um, and in our, this is from our general plan. And then from uh, area plan, here is a cross section showing a roundabout. Um, Again, roundabout with trains are not unheard of, but also not very common, so kind of a new thing. Um, so it looks great, right? We should build this, totally. This is the utility map. Um, so you can see these are 72-inch box culverts tying into an, an unknown size box culvert, which connects to where, where uh, I just showed you. The black lines are overhead utility lines, all needing to be undergrounded. Um, and then just a whole soup of other things running through there. And so this is what turned what would be a typical inconvenience, like, oh my god, what are you guys doing out there disrupting the middle of our intersection, to let's be in the newspaper every week, let's have pitchforks and knives and, you know, People weren't very happy. Um, sorry, trying to look at my notes. I don't know why I even take notes, because I never read them while I'm up here. Um, so we did do the project. It's pretty much done um, years later. So I'm going to kind of step through the different aspects of it, uh, starting from a complete streets and then kind of leading into the stormwater, more of the uh, green streets aspects. So from a pedestrian standpoint, we now have crossings at all five legs of the roundabout. And you can see here that uh, they're very short. You have only one lane of traffic to worry about at one time. So pedestrians are looking in one direction. They have a refuge area, and then they look in one direction until they cross the street. Um, much better, particularly if you've spent the day doing wine tasting. So here's just a, a better view of it, nice, nice short distance. So from a cyclist standpoint, um, I'm sure most of you know, when you build a roundabout and build it correctly, you're slowing traffic down. You slow traffic down to the point where cyclists can use the lane as a vehicle would. Um, that has been extremely successful. Uh, it's amazing the number of cyclists we've had running through here. So these are 
actual shots. We didn't even have to wait for a cyclist to come through. Um, however, there were some problems from a cycling standpoint. Okay, not a great picture, but um, this is from our bike plan. Uh, down here is Healdsburg Avenue coming from the freeway going into the roundabout right here. Uh, the green line is the Foss Creek path, which again is a multi-use path. Um, and then we have uh, proposed class two bike lanes. So I should have replaced the slide, but a lot of what happening is happening off of the, off the, the slide here. Healdsburg, small town, 12,000 people. It has a huge bike community. Um, they're both formal organized rides and just a lot of cycle advocates. We have a couple of shops where people come and they rent bikes and they go on 50 mile, 100 mile rides. Um, the two main entrances and exits out of the town are either through here, which goes right through the roundabout, or down Healdsburg and out Old Redwood Highway, which will go to all of the communities south. So the planners or city council or whomever at whatever point decided that people coming in from the south should be getting on this pathway bypassing Healdsburg Avenue. That was a big mess. So this is the cross section also from that same area plan, and you'll note we have eight foot parking, 11 foot travel lanes, and then the two way left turn lane. It was a road diet through here. It was four lanes, road dieted down to the three. Um, but now you're looking at cyclists, perhaps quite a few cyclists coming through here. And you add all of the large vehicles that are in that 11 foot lane with the parking lane, it makes for a not very comfortable passage for cyclists. Um, it became kind of a big deal, people complaining through city council. But luckily, because we did have the road diet, we had additional pavement. So we made a modification and we kept some of the pavement rather than moving the curb to where it's shown here, we left it where it was, um, thus allowing this buffer you can see between the parking stall to the um, edge of travel lane we have about four and a half feet. Um, what's more, because we have a lot of stuff going on here, we added sharrows in a non-typical method. Typically, a sharrow is going to um, designate a bike route. In this case, we have a total of three sharrows in a very short area. It's not part of a bike route, but we know cyclists are using it, so we're getting them to align themselves correctly, particularly going in the southbound direction because Otherwise, they can get trapped going into an on-ramp. So um, it was a pretty good solution. Cyclists were much happier after we made this change. And we did it all before construction. Um, so now we're jumping from the complete streets to more of the green streets. Uh, here is some porous uh, gutter. Uh, again, we have, we have the capturing rain in the landscape medians. We also have um, filtered drainage inlets at a couple locations, which I don't have pictures of, but I wanted to show you um, the, this system, which is, again, the porous gutter pan, where the water will come in, fill up into a capture zone, and just as Josh was talking about, it's engineered material uh, meant to treat the water in addition to the obvious filtering of the gutter, which would then get picked up by street sweeping. Water can stay in here and then um, slowly start migrating into the undisturbed soil beneath it. Or in the case of larger events, if that water fills up, it goes into a perforated pipe, which then would empty out into a storm drain. At this location is where we would have the catch basin on the, on the curb. So um, keeping more of the water underground as opposed to in the rain gutters, um, but still uh, doing the bioretention and biofiltering. Just a couple quick pictures of the construction. Um, this is where we're, they're putting in that material. Here you can see the 
plastic along the side of the road. Here's the roadway. And then here they are pouring in the pervious gutter. And one last thing, so the creek I talked about earlier and, and overall aesthetics going in, um, where I had pointed to previously was roughly this area. You can see very old um, material for this uh, culvert, which was going under the roadway. We were able to daylight some of it, but certainly not as much as we would like. So trying to make people aware of the creek, even when they can't see it, um, we added some aesthetics here. You can see the um, blue crystal within the concrete, so people are reminded that there is a creek under there. Oop. Oh, shoot. Um, so it doesn't show. Apparently, this slide deck is <laughs> previous to the ones I changed. But the other thing we did, it, this beautiful fencing, I had some close-ups of it. So when you're here and when you're walking along this pathway, rather than the standard redwood fence defining, we have a, a open, um, got the right, the rusted look of the steel railings. It's, so it's beautiful so people are made aware of the creek as they walk through the entire area. And so what I don't have a picture of, because the project isn't done, is the um, plantings. So we have 2,814 plants going in. My um, planning director reminds me of this every day because he has to maintain that. Um, but uh, yes, greenification is a word. Uh, so from the aesthetic standpoint, we're you know, making what was a real eyesore not only way more, way more functional, but uh, much more pleasing. So just as a frame of reference, this is, the, this is the creek where it's in the culvert. Here was what I showed you with the blue pattern. The pattern was supposed to be continued through the roundabout in cobble, and then back under, and then along the path again. So then that creek is exposed from much of the rest of the city. So I don't know how I did on time. I felt like I talked really, really fast. What was that? Um, it's in the neighborhood of 10 million. Oh, and I, I did want to say, I know a lot of you are here regarding funding. I don't have any great information on funding. This was uh, largely city funds because of the amount of utility work, uh, utility month, money paid for all of the undergrounding, which was the bigger expense here. Um, and then we have some local tax measures and other local funds were all compiled to pay for this. Yes? Are you saying that you still would aim at capital requirements? The, well, it was city utilities. The city of Hillsburg has their own electric department. So all the undergrounding was done by our own electric department. And then the sewer and water and storm drain all city, and yes, so it was our funding that, so much of the $10,000, uh, $10, 10 million, $10 million that we spent on the project was related to the utility work. The um, surface stuff was not nearly as expensive. Okay. And um, sorry about the slides, that we will upload the correct slides for the, in, the um, website, so my apologies. Oh. I feel like, am I the only one that can't see the pointer? Oh, there it is. That's not helpful. Next up, Otis Chan and Leo Chow from San Mateo. This is not your presentation, but this should be. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Mrs. Davis. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Otis Chen. This is Leo Chow. I know it's been a long afternoon. Before we start, I want to do some exercise to find out who is here. Are there any, are there any planners here by chance? Okay. Are there any civil engineers? Good. How about traffic engineers? One. How about grant writers? Great. Landscape architects, one, two. Maintenance workers, law enforcement, parents, shoppers. Now, you may wonder why I asked that question. The reason is San Mateo really works well because we have been revolving from curb cut to install chunky domes to bulb up curb extension to complete street to sustainable street, which we have won in 2015. We have won. I know Richard, I think you're here. Yeah, I, yeah. Anyway, so in order for us to look into what we have done in, the, in terms of the GI, which Leo will give us a little presentation in terms of lesson learned, let's look at where is San Mateo. So, San Mateo is actually right here, which is roughly about, which is roughly about 20 miles from San Jose. I'm sorry, the mouse is not working too well here. And we do have a P-Day area. The P-Day area is actually within the purple uh, color right here. I'm sorry, this is a little technical difficulty because I'm trying to make this work better. Uh, yes, yeah, not really responsive. So the ledger on the right side shows the blue lines. The blue, the blue lines are actually the complete streets. Yeah, that's the same one, yeah. Yeah, the blue, the, blue, the blue lines are the complete street. This one is one of them would be sustainable street. And the one in the southern end, which is the Lloyd Meadows, would be and at the sustainable street in the future. And the complete street that we have finished about four years ago, which is the Delaware Street, that was the first complete street we ever had. And the upper corners that we're looking at, the square legends, those are the boat bows with GI that Leo will touch on later, uh, later on. Uh, now, the next slide, okay. And now maybe Leo, you can help us to uh, provide some of the uh, project. Hi everyone, as Otis mentioned um, at first, City of San Mateo has several projects that already have completed with GI, and we also have one that working on, that I'm working on with Josh, um, which I will touch up on um, at the end, keep that as a secret. <laughs> so here's the first project that we are looking at, um, the 800 Humble, it's also another name for the Popular Condor Safety Improvement Project, Originally, this project was for popular off-ramp improvement. If anyone ever been into that area, every f anyone would know that intersection was insanely crazy. People flying off the off-ramp and other people is afraid to cross the street. No one could see and there's many accidents there. Ever, I, whenever I did the project, everyone was appreciate how this project was done. but. Today, we are not focusing on that. We are focusing on the second part of it, which is the uh, Bobao, the pedestrian safety improvement. You could see in the picture right here, um, just as oldest move, this is the after picture of the construction where we have the midwalk crossing, uh, curb extension, along with a uh, rubbing fashion beacon, and also a landscape. Those landscape are made those landscapes are considered green infrastructure. But before 2015, we don't have a name of it. 
we just call it, you know, landscape, full food planner, blah, blah, blah. But now we finally identify a name for it. So for this uh, particular project that we've done, there's also a second phase of this, which is just north of what we see here. Sorry, take a little bit time to load. But it's a cool presentation because you could see before and after. As we move to the intersection, this is also part of the popular improvement project. Reason why we created this project was because there's three schools nearby. There's San Mateo High School. Um, take my notes out here. There's San Mateo Adult School and also College Park Elementary School. Uh, with the Bobao improvement in this intersection, we shortened the distance of pedestrian travel across the intersection. Pedestrian as in student or parent who bringing the student across the street. And with all those concrete, or the original concept was all those concrete that we use as a waste of space. We don't need that many people to, we don't need that many creep concrete for people to stand on the corner. Therefore, we decided to let's try this new term, green infrastructure, and then therefore we um, implementing this. So everyone asked me how much this project costs. Including the median, the total construction of this project costs about $1.6 million. But just for the two bulb out that you saw in this intersection and the previous picture, uh, the project costs about $350,000 to $400,000 for this two corner with the green infrastructure. And that's along with uh, pedestrian lighting, also as wrapping fashion beacon and high risk crosswalk. This project, um, sorry, this project was also grant funded from Transportation Authority. Uh, well, it was funded by them because of the offering improvement originally, but city did contribute some of the money for this green infrastructure portion as well. Yeah, so I did ask earlier, uh, there any law enforcement here? The reason is that when we first, this is the before picture. So there are four wheelchair ramps at the corners. When we first lay out the socket line, the socket line in construction is not the line for the curb face finish, which is in a five feet offset, which means if this was the curb, the socket line is five feet out into the street. The first thing we got the phone call was from the deputy chief, fire chief. He said, Otis, are you guys working out there? I said, yes, we are. Our fire engine cannot make the turn. And we are trying to explain to him that, you know, on paper, everything looks fine. It works. So the template works, but what, they, what the fire engine, the operator, are thinking that they will be hitting the curb. But that was not the curb phase, which is the line that we are trying to, to have the socket out there and confirm the elevation. So what we did was, we were able to, we had to modify on the field. So again, as you can see, I would call this northeast corner right here. This is a strict face here. It was supposed to bulb up like this one. But because of the potential impact to the fire truck, we had to cut back. So what we did was we had to compromise and modify and discuss with the contractors, see what we can do. And for this particular project, it worked out quite well because we were able to work out a compromise solution. As you can see this photo, that you may not see it too well here. Even though we cut back the curb already, this sign, the red curb, always got hit. And we do provide the inlet. And one lesson they will also learn is when we designed this project, we did not include the overflow system. So two years ago or a year ago, we had a very intense storm. After the first rain, we have hundreds of phone calls. The intersection were flooded with water. And we kept looking on the joint and say, what happened? You know what? That wasn't built. It was, it was not part of it. So we're able to adjust what we need to do on the field and address the, the, the needs that we had to deal with. But overall, 
as you can see, the before and after, I still believe this is a very successful project. Let me give this uh, project a little bit background as well. This is actually our North Central Pedestrian Improvement Project. Original, this project was to just uh, be mobile pedestrian improvement. Same reason, we don't need that extra concrete on the side. We decided to do green infrastructure with it. As Otis mentioned, that the fire department have some issues with the design layout, so we have to reduce the project scope. And therefore, um, the reason why it was overflow because the capacity got reduced. It couldn't contain as much of the stormwater at, that was before design. Therefore, we have to include it. We have to add in the storm in it just to prevent that overflow happen again. And just curiosity, how much do you think a project like that would cost to maintain? Just one intersection. Maintaining as in picking up trash and also um, inspecting the soil. Anyone? Per month, per intersection per month. Uh, consultant, city, both. Well, the cost that we got from consultant was about $200 per month per intersection. So just keep a heads up for planners in mind. Whenever we plan for the project, remember to factor in that cost for future on. Because uh, we, the first time we did it, we didn't really think about it thoroughly, and it turned out to be quite expensive. And also one thing about that North Central project, that was a federal funded project. It was funded by um, OBAG and Lifeline. A total of $1 million and city covered the rest of the 400K that we put the improvement in. And now here's the one that we are working on, 4th, MU and Fremont. <clears throat> So this is our upcoming GI improvement. This project was funded by BASMA and EPA. Thanks to Josh, helped me with that agreement and the money. We actually received 200K, $200,000 for both construction and design. This project was meant to be a pilot project for our green charrette design. Uh, green charrette design is it's a typical GI detail um, that Josh touched on, it was, and we, the city was able to benefit from it using the design to develop our own green infrastructure with our internal staff in-house. So how did we end up with this intersection? There is actually a four step to this. First, we look at all the street and see what could use an improvement in the city standpoint. And this location was identified because there is a lot of pedestrian in the nearby adjacent um, area. And this is an area very close to the PAD area in downtown. As you could see, it's just two block off our PAD map. The apartment um, nearby actually have a lot of pedestrian traffic walking through to downtown. And this was a really ideal location for us. And when we pick this location, we're trying to pick a typical intersection where we could use it as a sample for future project with the high traffic volume going to US 101 on 4th MAU, all the people will see what is going on in the city of San Mateo and it set a really good example for everyone. And then, um, Another tool we used was Green Planet, which uh, Tony and Jin will mention later, tell you about. This is a potential, um, this is a green infrastructure location tracker where it point out the pot potential location for GI. And it definitely helped us identify this location was one of the best location there is. Well, there were several, but this is the best one. Lastly, we look at the intersection. If there's any storm in it, 
was it easy to modify the intersection without trying to build too much and spend too much money? The main point of this project is to reduce as much money as possible to get the best benefit. And yes, this project has tons of in it, all over the place, all four corners have it. And it was the ideal location for us. And we could easily convert those in it into an overflow system device. It was a lesson learned from the previous project that overflow system will help. Uh, this project is actually in design right now, but very close to finish, complete, and we uh, anticipate to complete this project by next year. And if we do, welcome everyone to come take a look at it. So in closing, I would like to let you know that the uh, Lloyd Meadows project, which is right at the lower, head, lower hand right hand side of the uh, chart, I mean the, the map, it will be funded by OBAC grant. And the North Center Drive is a company of grants, and I'm not sure which grants they have, but I know it's a company of grants. So for those grant writers out there, I need your help so they can get more money for San So <laughs> uh, I guess that concludes the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, we are more than happy to answer. Uh-oh, okay, yes. Yes, so the pink area is all the PDA area in San Mateo, including uh, the railroad corridor and the downtown and the Camino as well. So we are aware of that, yes. Yes. Uh, we are actually uh, working on the pre-design right now, so we are come uh, with a survey information, and I don't want to hop too much time, so I guess, uh, oh, okay, all right. I'll just say, you can kind of go at it to begin, but since you guys have to leave right away, oh, we'll take one more questions on, on this presentation, and then we'll have a, a longer 10 minute discussion. Okay. At Concar and Delaware out, because that's a great project, MTC had money in it, about half a million dollars, actually. Uh, at the time when we did the complete street concept on Delaware, that was, we were told that there would be a development coming in, so I do not have a strict answer for you. Any other questions for Leo and Otis? Well, thank you guys so well, much. Thank you very much. This great. Okay, we can take a little 10 minute break and we'll come back um, and have the Green Planet Toolkit presentation.
We'll get started in just a couple minutes. If you walked in late and did not check your name, your name off on the sign-in sheet, please do so before you go. They will be on the outside um, sign-in table. Okay, we are going to have a presentation from Tony Hale of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. This is the last item in our agenda today before our Q&A. The Green Planet Toolkit is his presentation and uh, his colleague Jing Wu is also here for question and answer afterward. I wanna do a couple housekeeping things before Tony um, comes up. We have more agendas and more bios out front if there weren't any copies when you, you came in. Also, this event is, we're trying to um, get this event, uh, uh, I guess, eligible for CM credits if you have an AICP certification. Um, we're still confirming that, but please do sign in on our AICP sign-in sheet out front as well. I know there's tons of funding questions and that sort of implementation stuff. We're gonna have Josh come back again and talk more in detail about some of the funding streams. So um, sit tight, but first, Tony, thank you. Thank you very much, Christy. And thank you all for, for having us here today. Um, a lot of the, the information that you've seen presented by Josh, by Leo Otis, and, um, and uh, well, those three in particular have, have had the benefit of, of some of the information emerging from the Green Planet tool set. And so what I am going to be um, going through in this uh, quick presentation is uh, the different uh, aspects of the tool set, the different modules that make up the tool set, and uh, how it might benefit you should you choose to, to use it. Um, so Green Planet, um, it's been used in a number of cities around the Bay Area, and in particular, it, it was used in the city of San Mateo. Um, Ken Chin, one of, a colleague of, uh, of Otis and, and Leo, uh, after using it, said the improvements in Green Planet are great. It, it, it is cool, useful, and usable. It will help the city move from the pin the tail on the donkey approach to, to a better one. And um, I think it's really important to you know, kind of take this to heart because one of the ways that, that Green Planet um, really tries to uh, level up things and improve the situation is to move from just the opportunistic approach where you do green infrastructure wherever the opportunity emerges to more plan based right more determined opportunistic to deterministic um, where you look at the landscape evaluate certain things prioritize factors develop a plan and then try and follow that plan to the best of your ability still taking opportunities as they emerge but really um, the recognizing that the only way to achieve your goals is by planning for those things 
Um, just going back here, I'll emphasize it again, but let's see, where's the, is this it? Yeah. Um, Greenplanet.sfei.org is where you can find out all you need to know about, uh, about the tool set. So um, we did, unfortunately, we don't have any printed matter for you to take away. I wish we had brought it along, but that's where you should go. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, as I mentioned, we worked with a number of cities around the Bay Area uh, the, through funding by EPA and the State Water Board. Um, we've developed uh, these different modules, which cover planning, um, optimizing, and tracking, reporting green infrastructure. So we know that, at least in public works, they need to report out their portfolio of green infrastructure, right? So what you'll hear is, is are different tools that can help you with that aside from planning. And uh, some of the information that goes into the kind of bedrock of, of Green Planet, um, scientific information like hydrology, uh, watershed science, as well as more the social sciences like economics and others. Um, and the key thing is, is that it's free to use. You can download the planning elements from the website and, and use them in your, um, your own environment. And these are the different places where Green Planet has been deployed. So let's get into the nitty gritty. What are the pieces that make up Green Planet? Let's start with the site locator tool. What that is meant to do, this is something that you heard Otis mention, right? It's a way to identify opportunities within your given landscape, right? So you have the cityscape and you're trying to figure out where can we put green infrastructure. Using the site locator tool, it can help to narrow down the infinite possibilities to um, a smaller subset. Then going from there, you can use, so from there you have the opportunity map emerging. Then you can use the optimization tool in conjunction with the modeler to determine the different optimal LID scenarios. So what that means is that you have areas now where, where you, with that opportunity map can identify those areas where you can put green infrastructure, but you're interested in knowing what type, what number to, uh, to put in place in order to achieve certain outcomes. Let's say reduction of PCB, reduction of mercury flowing into the bay. That can be determined by using this modeler to, to achieve that. And then from there, you can develop your watershed planning documents. So City of San Mateo developed that, the, the report that, um, that Otis and, and Leo held up. Um, so from there, then, then they've developed green infrastructure. They put it in the ground, and they want to track it. They can use the tracker tool to do that. So working together, that's how the tool set presently works. All right, so the site locator tool, let's go into a little bit more detail there. It's about determining the possible locations. And you can see here, this is a map of, the, of Sunnyvale on the right-hand side. And what goes into the tool are a combination of some regional data sets as well as locally sourced data. So that's really important to understand. So there are when, when I'm talking about regional data sets, those are about the geophysical realities of the Bay Area. So things like soil type, depth to groundwater, um, as well as certain kind of boundaries and things like that that are just kind of can be set on a regional scale. But that your city might also have different local data that is critically important to incorporate in here. So you might have, for instance, a priority development area. You might have information about public and private ownership. You might have exclusion zones where you know you don't, for whatever reason, want to put green infrastructure. So all of that kind of goes in to, the, uh, to this priority um, evaluating tool called the site locator tool. And then out comes this map. And the map isn't the only thing that comes out. You also have all this kind of tabular information and data behind the map. But that allows you to kind of go ahead and, and click on a given polygon here to figure out why was this weighted, this deeper blue, weighted more than this, uh, than this unranked location? Why was this unranked? You can click it and, and actually get that information. So when we look, for instance, at this particular location in Sunnyvale, we can see um, certain things as we zoom in that make it really hospitable to green infrastructure, things like you know this really wide, imp uh, impervious area 
Um, but you might want to know, oh, was this more highly ranked because it was within a priority development area? Was that also why? And being able to daylight the weighting of different factors and priorities is really one of its strengths. So rather than kind of leaving it to two people alone in a room to decide where the green infrastructure goes, you can give more transparency to those choices um, by um, putting things into the tool and then being able ex post facto to interrogate those choices. So it's an Esri-based tool. You download it, you use it to, to do that. And this is another project that we worked on where you have the entire, this is on a very different scale from just one city, right? This is the entire East Bay. This is the San Pablo Spine. So you heard Josh mention that, and this was an evaluation. Where could green infrastructure go, not on that city scale, but all across the East Bay? And you can see the difference in color going from this kind of darker to the lighter, where as it gets neutrally ranked, it gets lighter. And so you can kind of spot those areas where it's most important to place green infrastructure. And then zooming in, this is, this is in um, kind of El Cerrito area, you can, you can see that, that when you, can, you can actually go much closer and magnify things and see the difference in the darker areas and the lighter areas. So the kinds of information that you can place into this engine to generate this map, you can, you can have those priority development areas, conservation areas, and other things. Um, and it's up to you to kind of figure out what information goes in. So part of it is that we have certain standard things that we would solicit from you, like, for instance, the width of your streets, the width of your sidewalks, um, the height of your curbs, and things like that. Um, but then you can also uh, develop your own data that might influence the, um, the processing of this information. And so when we come in here, I'm going to kind of focus on this area here, because this is a very highly ranked area. Why is that? And you can see that it's, this is El Cerrito Plaza. And it, it's a priority development area. It's also this vast, um, uh, Im impervious surface that could very much benefit from green infrastructure. The tracker is the tool that you would use once you've established green infrastructure and you want to know where is it now in the landscape. So you saw a, a, a kind of version of that, if you will, with um, what Leo and, and Otis um, put together on their Esri map, but sometimes you might want to have something that's a little bit more specialized, and that's what the Green Planet Tracker offers. It, it helps you to track and then report out different features of your green infrastructure. So you can see here that this, these different red areas, these are uh, the drainage management areas for all the different LID that are in the landscape. And this system, the tracker, can serve as your primary database for your green infrastructure. You can just use it as the way to store everything you need, or it can be just secondary. You might have your own kind of GIS-based system uh, in-house, and you can take that information and then export it and import it into, into green, uh, green Planet Tracker. And you can then use that as outreach. You can take maps that it generates and embed it into your public works website or your planning website. And uh, the key thing is being, you know, we've heard how expensive this is. We've heard how expensive these different installations are at, at, at present. And so being able to show the investment um, to the public and to whomever you would like to demonstrate it is really key, and that's one of the things that Green Planet can help. So you can see some of the kind of information you can track, you can Im import pictures, documents, reports, et cetera. Um, and, and so it's, it's a publicly facing, but you can also set security on it. You can have certain information that's kind of behind the curtain, as it were. So here you can see you know, a lot of area covered by green infrastructure in Sunnyvale. Uh, you can see Oakland, Richmond, et cetera. Um, so some of the key features, uh, as I mentioned before, um, you have the maps and the security, but you can also leverage a modeling engine to calculate effectiveness. Now, this is effectiveness as narrowly defined in terms of water quality, but nevertheless, you can see kind of what is happening to the, what would be projected to happen based on a model um, when you put your portfolio into the ground. And so just an another key thing is to be able to um, kind of leverage some very commonly used tools like Google Street View to see change over time. 
So what you see here, this is Hanley's Toyota. This is pre-installation. This is just looking at Google Street View, and it's integrated into the Green Planet Tracker. So being able to see the past, this is 2008. You can kind of see that up in this slider. And then this is 2017, after some bioswales and different features have been put in here at the street and, uh, and in interior to this parcel. So th the point is, is that Green Planet Tracker didn't invent Google Street View. <laughs> it's just leveraging that. And that's, um, and that's a really great thing to be able to just kind of take and, and use off the shelf. And then effectiveness reporting. I alluded to this earlier. I'm not, not going to go into de detail here. I think this is a bit of overkill. But the point is, is that you can, you can track the effect of the, um, the investment in green infrastructure over time. So here you have the different years. And you can see how the ground is becoming uh, less impervious or more pervious, um, more permeable. And, and so you're going to be able to see that as projected through the model. And then this is, this is something that I'm not going to spend much time at all, but this is, this is a, an optimizer that's able to show, um, this is on the planning side, to, to answer those questions, how many and what type of green infrastructure should you put into the ground in order to meet your um, particular water quality goals. So every one of these dots, right, dots upon dots upon dots upon dots, each one might be a portfolio of 300 or more different installations. And what that's meant to impress upon you is just how difficult it is to arrive at the optimal scenario where you're able to achieve, let's say, a 40% reduction in, uh, in PCBs. Um, and you can have a range of different possibilities where you can, you can um, if you look at this particular optimal scenario, right, where you've spent, uh, it looks to be about uh, 60, 65 million uh, dollars to achieve this particular portfolio, um, you, can, you can spend uh, 60 million dollars or going on the same effect, you can spend 150 million dollars. So it's just this, the, the range of possibilities of the, of the optimal choice to the suboptimal choice um, is great. And so it's meant to, to really convey to you um, <laughs> that you can, you can go very wrong with your investments if, if this is what you're aiming for, this, this reduction of PCBs. And what you see on the right-hand side is the result of some of Jing's work to generate a map um, to show how many, in, uh, uh, how many installations of um, green infrastructure you would need to achieve, let's say, a 20% PCB reduction. And I'm going to zoom in here so you can see that this says 126 different features in this particular area. Um, this is in West Oakland. You can see San Pablo running here. Um, earlier, uh, Josh presented about a project that was over in this area um, in, in Emeryville. Um, so now we're in the neighboring area. And you can see that, that these darker areas are about the piece indicating PCB yield. And so if you were just to have more, uh, m more green infrastructure in this particular area it would be less effective than placing all of your investments here, which is not to say there aren't other things other than water quality to drive those choices. But if your goal is to reduce PCB, then that's, then that's where you'd place it. And this is with a 40% PCB reduction. So if you're aiming for a higher PCB reduction, then the numbers change. Suddenly now everything is much more distributed because you need to kind of cast a broader net to capture more PCBs. So I think that's where I'm going to stop. There's more that we could talk about, but maybe we can save that for the, for the question and answer. Yes? Yeah. For like groundwater, do you guys have regional database already kind of like set up for the county that, you know, each cities can just use that as a base? Yeah, so we do have regional data sets that are used for Green Planet as well as um, 
for uh, by other people. So people do rely on our regional data sets that have certain geophysical factors, um, such as the information about groundwater, um, soil types, things like that, that are kind of able to be characterized at a regional scale. Um, there are, however, um, other information that cities typically hold that can't be necessarily generalized. Um, that that if we were to take our own tool and and put it into to effect, we would we would solicit that, that those data from you and put it into the tool. But you can also, if you have the resources to kind of run the tool and and put the data in, then you can do that yourselves. But as far as the kind of like basic data, then it's it that is readily downloadable um, through the website greenplanet.sfi.org. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Tony. Thank you. What I want to do now is um, open up the dialogue or question and answer period. So I will invite the panelists to come to the table. Um, I'll be out in the audience with a couple microphones, um, and we can reference some of the presentations, especially the funding um, aspects of the roadmap to funding. Um, so uh, get your questions thinking ready, and then just raise your hand, and I can come to you. Oh, thanks for the lights. I have a question for Tony. Hi. Yes, hi. <laughs> uh, so as you assign uh, priorities to the, your optimizations tool, do you differentiate if uh, an area is considered um, an individual parcel project versus right away versus regional project? Does that matters or you're just looking at strictly maybe from land use perspective? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. And it really speaks to the way the tool works that we aren't assigning priorities. We are processing your own city's priorities. So in other words, if you have information on a parcel level scale um, and uh, you want to, to kind of weigh different things accordingly, then uh, what we would do is to say, let's say you, you want to take into account um, priority development area as one factor, as let's say, let's take the example of the city of San Mateo, where priority development area was one factor, but it wasn't the only factor, right? That's how they were able to identify that particular opportunity just outside the priority development area. If they had put priority development area as the only priority, <laughs> then it would have been 100% and pretty easy to figure out. Anything in there would be great. But um, that's not the only factor. Instead, what it does is it weighs priority development areas, let's say, 20% of the total. And then you might have um, uh, a certain kind of, there's priority development area, and then you have um, other kind of conservation areas where you want to kind of ring the conservation area with, with information. So we would define that, and that might be at the parcel scale, but it might be a little bit broader than that. Um, so you would, that's the key part of either using data that you have already or developing new data that expresses your priorities, right? And then putting that into the thing. So you have 20% for the priority development area. Let's say 30% for the conservation area where you want to have green infrastructure as well. And, and then other, a number of other factors. And you put that into this machine, as it were. It runs and then spits out the opportunity map. And the first map that emerges maybe isn't to your liking. And you'd want to know, why did it weight this particular parcel higher than the others? And you can click on it and say, and it will tell you exactly why. What were the factors that went into that? Um, so, do, does that address your question? Okay. Do you have a, oh. I think I'll just end a little bit. I think this is a, a typically uh, an iterative process. So, we actually work really closely with the city staff doing this waiting part. First, I figure out what exactly local data you want to use. You know, we do have a, a lot of regional layers, you know, land use, soil type, slope, you know, that already pre. Um, built into the tool, so you don't have to worry about it. It's more like city-specific data, what you want to use. And you know, those are, there is a things you want to favor, like say PDAs, and maybe close to your city old parcels, public, you know, like parks, close to the school, those are pl places you prefer, but there's also places we want to exclude, we call it knockout. You know, like where's your gas line? 
whether utility, whether you know fire hydrant. So those are yeah, those are like exist existing utilities or the structures which could be a uh, obstacle to. So that's also typically go into as well when we analyze. That's why when we ranking some location higher because those location may be possibly to do something. However, there is a utility line close by that's be more expensive. So therefore, those could potentially do something, but you is ranked lower. So it's 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 a lot of information. It's very customizable and flexible. It all depends on you know. Uh, it's it's in the end. I think the output those map uh, how that rank it on the side actually reflect what the city prefer. What your local kind of priorities are. I, you know, one of the knockouts could even be where's their metered parking. You know, if the city doesn't want to lose a revenue stream of, of parking stalls because they're being converted or something like that, you know, that, that is a layer that can be added weight to. It is very flexible. I'll come with the mic. Uh, for purposes of uh, legalities, you know how you guys are able to draw on like the Google base maps from the prior years and such um, with other like private companies or anybody else um, applying your platform onto their work, is that something that transcends into the service or is that just exclusive to you? So you're, you're referring to the integration of the Google Street View into Correct. Tracker yes. specifically? Yeah, so that's, um, that is something that we do would pay for because now Google has started to monetize the use of the APIs that allow for that integration. So SFEI pays for it currently. And that's one of the reasons why the planning tools that you would download and use locally, those are free for your use. The tracker tool, which is kind of not the planning side, but it's more the tracking and reporting side, that does have a license fee attached to it to help defray the cost of those, those API calls to Google, which will then translate to us paying Google. I see. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Hi, this is a question for Larry. Um, with your roundabout um, and that those train tracks coming through, <laughs> or the the one line, um, what have you guys designed or planned to do with when that smart train comes through town? to block, uh, block traffic from conflicting with all the motion in the roundabout? We, we put in much of the infrastructure, but I did not put in the gates at this time because why maintain something that we don't know exactly how long it's going to be? I mean, it could be 20 years, um, hopefully sooner than that. Um, the plan is, is to have the gates go directly into the roundabout um, so it stops all traffic. Um, it actually much simpler if you remember the drawing of beforehand how you would be able to you'd have to stop so much traffic and make sure no one was in the intersection now the gates can go down right in front of the tracks as if it were crossing a single lane which essentially it is oh so it won't block each entrance to the roundabout it would just block it would block the roundabout the itself so all traffic will have to stop through the roundabout when the trains coming through Um, in the East Bay, um, most of, well, actually all, all permittees for the MRP are, are currently beginning preparation of uh, county or, in, the, in my case, as I work for Cotterick County, or municipal um, city-wide uh, GI plans. And in most cases, they're using ESRI's, um, you know, uh, Arc, Arc GIS Online, AGOL. So a question I have is how to potentially integrate, you know, this great tool, this tool here, which is sort of a, we may, we may not even talk about its relationship to AGOL, since that's, you know, in our case, we have a, we have a uh, consultant who's doing our GI, GI um, uh, based upon the Stormwater Resources Plan, intending to do GI priority identification using AGOL online. Mm -hmm. So we want to, we'd like to know, basically from your standpoint, how, you, how these, your tool can be integrated with that approach, which is frankly most of the consultants are using. Yeah, so the approach that a consultant might take, might, might, they might have their own tools. They might not be using green 
Planet at all. They may use the regional data sets that are packaged with Green Planet and then go from there and create their own kind of AGOL based um, tool. So they're under no obligation to use Green Planet. But um, if you want to use the, the Green Planet fr free solution, then it is a desktop based tool. It's not an a, a ArcGIS online tool. It's ArcGIS based, but it's uh, a toolbox that is integrated into the desktop client. And there's a good reason for that. Um, it is because that particular, first of all, when we were developing it, ArcGIS Online wasn't sophisticated enough to handle the type of priority analytics we were developing. Um, so that's, that's probably the main reason. Um, but also, uh, analysts still really like to use their desktop tools, we find. Um, the ArcGIS Online is great, and it's useful for kind of sharing out results, but it's um, still the desktop tools offer a lot more flexibility. Um, so in terms of integration, um, there's a way that you could share all the information out through ArcGIS Online as you are developing it through your desktop tools. Um, so, so as you're uh, developing those opportunity maps and associated data, you can push those up into ArcGIS Online. Um, and you can also take whatever is being developed in ArcGIS Online and use those data layers as inputs to the, the tools that you would develop um, on the desktop. So there's a pretty easy pathway to move between desktop and ArcGIS Online. It's just the Green Planet tool set is operating on the desktop. Perhaps it would probably be useful to have um, either a tool or a set of instructions for um, users at the municipal level for sh showing how they can bring in Green Planet into you know, re GI planning through ArcGIS or AGL Online. Yeah, and, and I think the real, just to kind of, uh, the, the most obvious thing is um, to maybe illustrate how people can, can continue to track their investments in green infrastructure by taking data off of G AGOL on ArcGIS Online and bringing it into Green Planet Tracker. So if you wanna do things on the planning side in your own system, fine. That doesn't exclude you from using other modules like the tracker or the, the, for reporting and things like that. So we can, we can talk about how to describe that process of downloading from ArcGIS Online and bringing it into Tracker. We've got about 10 minutes left and I wanted to give the floor to Josh for a little bit about some of the funding resources available on, on the website, but did someone else have a question? Okay, Josh? Yeah. Um, it's too small. I know, I'm not sure why this comes out so tiny, but I can do all this, uh, you know, squeezing and making things bigger. But I just want, I wanted to call your attention to um, San Francisco Shway Partnerships website, and we have a, a project web page just called Green Streets. Um, that really pulls together a lot of resources that um, could be useful from a public works perspective as, as designers, from a planning perspective in terms of policies and ordinances and funding um, and funding resources as well, case studies. So it's all there. They're all on tabs. So if you go to um, sfestuary.org slash green streets, that'll get you right there. Um, and also all of our projects are, are on the web page, and so you can look Look at the spine. You can look at Urban Greening Bay Area if you'd like, or or, or some of our um, nature-based uh, projects and wetland restoration and whatnot. Um, but on this page, um, planning and policy, we have um, a link to this report, which is the roadmap of funding solutions for sustainable streets. Um, and this is again when, when we brought all of these uh, players together from the transportation community, the resources agencies talking about how to crosswalk their grants and, and um, funding streams. Um, you know, we came up with, with action plans with every, or, or a number of the agencies taking, taking, um, taking ownership of some steps that they should take to make sure that their, uh, their funding programs are as flexible and as useful as possible. Um, this included, this includes, you know, 
looking at their own um, guidelines um, for, for grants and, and uh, seeing if it includes green infrastructure, if it, if it includes um, landscaping, or if landscaping needs to be operational. You'll find that there's lots of different definitions of what operational means. And so it gets very complex and very technical in, the, um, in, in grant management. So, um, so that's, what, that's what this is for. It's sort of a step-by-step -step, um, approach to um, getting these, these programs to become more user-friendly. Um, but on the, on the website itself, we have uh, explicitly called out a number of the Prop 1 uh, water, water grants, um, you know, or water bond grants. Um, and there's links to each one, and they get updated uh, semi-frequently, but they're updated right now to let you know what um, programs are open and accepting applications right now, um, and ones that fund uh, green infrastructure in particular, whether it be planning or for implementation or for both. Some allow for both. Um, what we have not put up here yet are some of the transportation funding uh, agents, uh, pro programs. So that is the next step uh, to add to it. But you know, just for example, no, you, know, you guys know how to follow a link. <laughs> um, we have the San, Francisco uh, the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund is open right now. That's the one that, that funded the Urban Greening Bay Area. Um, you know, their, their applications are due, I believe, the first week of December. And so this would just take you right onto their website and uh, you can get the RFP from there. Uh, what's difficult is that it takes you, you have to do the go back button to get back onto the page. It doesn't, uh, doesn't just take you out to a new window. Um, in fact, it takes you back out to the planning and policy tab. And I'm sorry that this rolls up and down so fast, but under planning and policy tab, we have model ordinances, um, which again is another step that's part of the MRP 2.0 that um, cities need to adopt. Um, it has a link to the Green Planet um, toolkit. It has um, it has a number of or it has a couple of uh, citywide plans that you can look at for examples that you may want to uh, refer to when you're doing the plans for your own cities. And like I said, there's there's the funding page, and we have uh, design guidance. It's it's essentially um, bringing up the the design handbooks of the various countywide programs. Uh, we will have the charrette. Um, outcomes in, in that added as well, but you can also find those in the Urban Greening Bay Area web page, project web page, um, and also case studies. So this is um, some past projects. You can go into our archives essentially and read up on some, some of the old projects that were done, what they cost, who funded them, what the outcomes were, and um, that might be instructive for you all moving forward. For these um, these projects here, do you have the operational costs built into the the reporting there? Uh, I, I know you have yeah, the, the, the. You'd find that information in the final reports. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Yep. Any last questions? I thought you guys had tons of questions earlier, but hopefully we got most of them answered. <laughs> well, thanks again to all the panelists. This has been good. Um, this will be uh, information available on the Planning Innovations website in a week or two with um, all the presentations, the correct presentations, and um, the actual video of the, the Planning Innovations website on MTC's webpage. There's links to get there. Um, we'll have it. Um, it's actually probably part of the flyer or even some of the information from the Eventbrite registration, but you can easily get there from MTC Planning Innovations. All right. Thanks so much. Good to meet you, too. Yeah, thanks, Christy. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Where, where are you going? Which, which stop? I'm taking the 74. Oh, you, you got it. And so the only thing is, is you said right out the door? Go out the door, take a right, okay. uh, first left, and then a right again. You know, it's, you're, you're jogging over one street. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, well we, take a we take a different line. We take a different line. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, I love, I love your presentation. I like the. Is that a Fuzzy? Yeah, it's cool.
Do you have to go all the way back to get to it? Like, can you jump to another spot? You, you can jump, but you need a mouse. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right.